Well, good morning. If you would, please open your Bibles to the New Testament epistle of James. As I've been given opportunities to preach, we've been working verse by verse through the epistle of James. And so today, we come to James chapter 4, 1 through 10, where we will see a life of enmity with God. So James chapter 4, 1 through 10. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. May God bless the reading of his word. Remember that the entire epistle of James is concerned with how do we know if you or if I have true saving faith. All throughout this epistle, James compares and contrasts what one says versus what is seen through one's relationships on earth. It's like that of diagnosing one's health. The physician analyzes the symptoms, might even take a culture and then observe what grows from it to determine the root problem. And likewise, James, he takes the symptoms of one's life and he looks at them through the lens of God's word. And he wants to see what is being cultivated. Is it genuine faith or is it that of lip service? Chapter 2, 14 to 24, it dealt with those that say they have faith, but the lack of fruit reveals otherwise. Chapter 3 then moved from behavior to the tongue And it reveals that we know someone has true saving faith by the evidence of a controlled tongue. And he clearly makes the point in 3, 9 through 12 that both blessing of God and cursing of brothers and sisters cannot come from the same mouth. And then moving forward in 3, 13 to 18, then he looked at the evidence within one's relationships, the result of which is based either on wisdom that is from below or wisdom that is from above. He clearly differentiates between the nature of those with saving faith and a deceived faith. And now in chapter 4, James is speaking directly to those whom it became clear from the evidence that they do not have faith. He begins by employing what is known as the Socratic method, which is a common form of teaching, and it's still to this day extremely effective. And for the lawyers in the room, according to the University of Chicago Law School, the Socratic method, it is a form of teaching, okay? And it seeks to get to the foundations of the student's views by asking continual questions for the purpose of exposing a contradiction. And then it thus proves the fallacy of the initial assumption. And that is exactly what the epistle of James is doing. He's asking questions in order to expose the contradictions and thus prove the fallacy of the initial assumption. So we have to ask, well, what is the initial assumption? Well, it was one's profession of faith. Are you saved is the ultimate question that James is repeatedly addressing. Today we hear responses from, I believe in God, or I'm spiritual, I'm religious, to I was baptized, or I've prayed the sinner's prayer. 
See, all of these are forms of professing belief. But James reveals to us that a mere profession is not sufficient. He looks at our life, our behavior. He looks at our tongue, our relationships, which are all the fruit of the wisdom that one lives by. The first five verses of chapter 4, I believe, are describing in greater detail what a life of wisdom that is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic, what it looks like. It reveals the effects of relationships horizontally with one another, and then he will turn to the effects vertically against God. And then we will see in verses 6 through 10 that it details a life that lives by wisdom that is from above. So with that introduction, let us look to our first point in verses 1 through 3. Point 1, the root and fruit of worldly wisdom. And parents... I know my own eight-year-old son, so that'll probably be the one point your children remember. So you should take good notes and be ready to talk about this one. The root and fruit of worldly wisdom. Four, one to three. What causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? What is the origin of the constant struggles, the disagreements, the quarreling, the friction within your relationships. From where does this type of symptom originate? That is the question that James is asking, and it is a question that gets to the heart of the matter. Too often we only focus on external symptoms, uh, the quarreling and the fighting, thinking that if we can stop those things, then all will be good. But in reality, all we do is chase one symptom to the next without ever addressing the root of the issue. Again, speaking to parents, I think you get what I mean, right? How often do we address our kids' behavior? Chasing one event to the next, especially if you have more than one. And we never get to the root problem, the sinful heart. Well, James, he's not chasing symptoms, But he's highlighting them to reveal to the original readers and to reveal to us that the symptoms, they are the fruit that is being produced from the root of wisdom. In this case, wisdom that is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Ultimately revealing who has true saving faith and who has a dead faith. And we need to first understand what is meant by quarrels and fights among you. The words that are used literally refer to battles or wars. They can be used for single battles or a series of battles that become an ongoing war. In verse 2, it has led some to believe that James is referring to physical wars that result in the loss of life through murder. But is he really referring to actual physical fights where lives are taken? In context, I don't believe so. I believe that James is speaking of verbal altercations, verbal arguments, verbal battles, and verbal wars that are taking place. As I said earlier, chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, it's a continuation of chapter 3, which is all about the tongue. He's describing the individual that has an uncontrolled tongue. As James says, it stains their reputation, stains the whole body of believers, And then is used by Satan himself to continue to cause division. It's the one who uses the same tongue in a vain attempt to bless the Lord and at the same time curse people who are made in the likeness of God. It's the one in 3, 14 to 16 that James says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and again, it is demonic. So the quarrels and the fights, they are active, verbal altercations, battles and wars that are being fought with the tongue. And these symptoms, they reveal the root problem, unbelief. James 4, 1 to 3 is describing what a life of unbelief looks like, a life of worldly wisdom. What is the origin of the symptoms of the quarreling and of the fighting? He tells us in verse 1, it is your passions that are at war within you. In verse 3, you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. 
Right? The fruit of this wisdom that is earthly, it is selfish passions. And the Greek word for passion here is hedone, from which we will derive hedonism. It's the pursuit of pleasure. It's the occupation of self-indulgence. And in this context, it's not that of intimate pleasure, but it's simply chasing your own desires. It's desires that are morally neutral in some sense, meaning that they are not necessarily good, they're not necessarily bad, but they are such a strong desire of self-satisfaction that one is unwilling to allow anything to stand in its way. It's this attitude of, I want what I want, and I will get what I want. That is the origin of the symptoms, the sinful self setting its heart on personal satisfaction. Bitter jealousy, selfish ambition are the nature of worldly wisdom. And what is the result of seeking self-satisfaction? What is the outcome, or maybe even better, what is the consequence that we see? Well, verses 1 through 3 tells us, you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you don't ask, and you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You see, the selfish attitude, it reveals the root issue of a sinful nature, and then the consequences of seeking personal satisfaction, it's a fountain of continual dissatisfaction. It's an empty pursuit. It's a vain attempt. Look at the text. You desire but you do not have. You covet, but you can't obtain. You don't have because you don't ask, but even when you do ask, you don't receive because you ask wrongly. You see, it's a conceited, empty pursuit that never ends, continually seeking selfish passions while never finding satisfaction. Fights and quarrels, these are symptoms of wrong passions, which leads to frustrated desires that result in fighting and quarrels. And round and round we go. As Douglas Moo says, it is a frustrated desire that leads to violence. Again, this is the fruit that grows from 314. If you have that bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, an endless pursuit will entail that only leads to frustrated desires and to broken relationships. There will be a visible trail that will be left behind you. Now, there are a few dangers that I am assuming that you will be facing, just as I have faced this week, and we need to be mindful of them. So I want to give you three dangers to be aware of as we think through this text. Danger number one automatically looking to others, thinking of the individuals that have hurt you in the past or even are hurting you currently. As we heard last week, with the judgment that you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? So fight the temptation to point the finger at the other person and look inwardly. Don't leave here saying, well, I wish so-and-so would have been here to hear the message. God has brought today you and I here to hear his word. The people that need to be here are here. Danger two, viewing your life through one circumstance. We have a tendency to characterize our lives based on one major circumstance, especially if it is a present circumstance circumstance and we wrongly think that everything in our lives is therefore broken well that's not an honest assessment so don't view your entire life through one circumstance danger number three an unwillingness to fight for truth right we are not to quarrel and fight over personal preferences but we are to stand firm in the christian faith and fight for the truth of god's word We have to remember, James is not addressing doctrine matters here. He's not dealing with false teaching, but he's dealing with sinful passions. 
battles for doctrine must be fought. So don't walk away thinking that there should never be grounds for battles. And to avoid all three of these dangers, it requires an honest self-reflection. And that is what James is calling each one of us to do. I mean, look at the text. I encourage you to keep your Bibles open. Look at it. The warnings and the exhortations that he is giving are now personal. He uses the personal pronoun you 14 times in the first four verses alone. Each one of us must self-reflect and see what fruit has been produced and is currently growing within our relationships. What is the trail that is behind you? I have to ask, what is the trail behind me? What do the relationships in my life reveal? Worldly wisdom will not only destroy relationships horizontally, but it also results in adultery against God vertically. This brings us to point two, the admonishment of worldly wisdom in verses four through five. The admonishment of worldly wisdom. He says in verse four, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it's to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Again, quoting from Douglas Moo in the Pillar New Testament commentary, he makes the point, and I quote, their tendency to imitate the world by discriminating against people in 2, 1 to 3, speaking negatively of others in 3, 1 to 12, exhibiting bitter envy and selfish ambition in 3, 13 to 18, and now pursuing their own destructive pleasures in 4, 1 to 3, demonstrates that their allegiance is to the world rather than to God. James makes this point by moving from addressing his readers as my brothers to you adulterous people. He is no longer saying my brothers or including himself, but he has now detached himself from those that he is addressing to highlight their separation from God. They are committing spiritual adultery. The relationship between God and his people, it is most often compared to that of a marriage. Listen to Isaiah 54, 5 to 6. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife, deserted and grieved in spirit, like a wife of youth. When she is cast off, says your God. Or in Jeremiah 3, 20. Surely as a treacherous wife leaves her husband, so have you been treacherous to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. Even Jesus called Israel a wicked and adulterous generation in Matthew 12, 39 and 16, 4. And now we see James. He's labeling his readers as adulterers. And makes the point with great clarity that friendship with the world is committing spiritual adultery against God. And it establishes one as an enemy of God. The word for friend here, it is philos, or often pronounced philos, from which we derive phileo. It's love. Or in Philadelphia, which means brotherly love. The picture is not just one of acquaintance with the world, but is one who loves the world rather than God. It's describing a a deep and intense and deep affectionate love for the evil world system. And a love for the world is that enmity with God. 1 John 2.15 do not love the world, world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. 1 Corinthians 3.19, for the wisdom of the world is folly with God. Or maybe even more clearly put, Jude 19, 
It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. Worldly people are devoid of the Spirit. See, in Scripture, when the world is spoken of in the spiritual sense, it is always in opposition to God. And the counter is true. When Christians are spoken of spiritually, we see consistently that it says that we are not of this world. Even James 1.27 says to keep oneself unstained from the world. As Rick read for us in Matthew 6.24, no one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Choosing friendship with the world is to choose to be at enmity with God. It means that you are hostile towards God, a sworn enemy of God himself. And you might say, well, wait a minute. I'm not hostile towards God. Just because I love the world, I'm still a kind person. I still believe in God. But the severity of the language that is used, it's to emphasize the point that God says, if you don't love him exclusively, then you are hostile towards him. And you're committing spiritual adultery. True believers are not of this world. And they're to have no fellowship with the world. Now, how can that be when we are in the world? Right? Even Jesus himself prayed in John 17 that God not remove his disciples from the world, but keep them from the world. So what does this mean? What does this look for, like for us? Well, cosmos, which refers to the world, in this sense, it's not speaking of the physical world, but of the spiritual world. Remember, James has been describing what worldly wisdom looks like from 3.15. Again, he said it's earthly it's unspiritual, it's demonic. He is referring to philosophical theories, secular psychology, man-centered ideologies, social constructs, things like these. It's conformity to heathen standards of thinking and of living, being devoid of the truth. Man-made wisdom that is demonic at its core is because anyone who is of the world is controlled by the spirit of the world and has no part with God. In verse 5, although it is extremely difficult to interpret, is intended to reemphasize that very point. Verse 5 says, Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says, He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Where naturally led at this point to think that James is quoting from another passage of scripture. However, there is not an Old Testament scripture or even new passage that contains these words. So it's commonly agreed that he's speaking in reference to the general teaching of scripture and not a particular passage. In essence, what he is asking is, do you suppose that scripture teaches this truth for no purpose? Or it teaches it wrongly? Do you really believe the scripture is wrong? And he's pointing us back to, I believe, chapter 1, 19 to 24. Where we are told to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger against the word of God. Don't look in the mirror and then walk away forgetting what you look like. Forgetting your sinful nature. But instead receive God's word with meekness which he tells us is able to save your souls. So scholars agree that James is telling his audience to adhere to the teaching of Scripture. The second half of the verse is where it gets more difficult to interpret. He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Many differ on the meaning of this verse. Some believe it's referring to God's jealously, jealously yearning for the Holy Spirit that he made to dwell in us which would be a drastic shift from the point that James has really been making. Many others believe, as do I after studying the text, that James is actually referring to the human spirit given at creation, which is now jealously envious of its own selfish 
desires. Right? That understanding naturally fits within the context of the point that is being made. It can be read and understood as, do you believe the scripture is wrong when it says the spirit that he caused to live in us envies intensely? It's a continuation of the point that scripture as a whole teaches that the human nature is fallen, totally depraved. When left to ourselves, each one of us is jealously envious over our own selfish passions. John MacArthur and James Addison, he helped me uh, the most in understanding this verse, so I will quote from him. In effect, James is saying, don't you know that you yourselves are living proof of the truth of Scripture, which clearly teaches that the natural man has a spirit of envy. Kurt Richardson says, the natural inclination of man's spirit when left unguarded from the temptations of the world is to envy. Without active faith, you will be at the mercy of your most base desires. And that is the exact point that James is making. You say you have faith, but the evidence of your life reveals something else. It reveals a friendship with the world. The evidence, he says, has been heard. It has been weighed. And again, it reveals friendship with the world. A.W. Tozer stated that the average professed Christian lives a life so worldly and careless that it is difficult to distinguish them from the unconverted man. So what does your life reveal? Is it a life that follows these philosophical theories, secular psychology, man-centered ideology, social constructs, which ultimately, all of them, are an attempt to fulfill sinful desires, sinful passions? Or are you receiving with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul? In contrast to friendship with the world, look quickly with me at James 2, 22 and 23. James 2, 22 to 23. You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was, filled, was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. But don't miss the next point. And he was called a friend of God. A friend of God, not a friend of the world. Abraham's belief, when he said that he believed, it was proven by his works. He believed and he obeyed and was therefore known as a friend of God, not a friend of the world. Again, we have to ask, what does the evidence in my life reveal? A friend of the world or a friend of God? Not sure, or maybe you can't give yourself an honest assessment. Well, Look at your life. Look at your social media accounts. Ask a trusted believer in Christ what they see in your life. Ask your spouse if your life reveals friendship with the world or with God. Students, honestly evaluate your life. Evaluate your friendships and ask yourself, are they pointing you towards obedience and holiness in Christ? Or are they drawing you away from Christ? Are they causing you to look more like the world? What evidence is there to prove your profession of faith? We now move from the admonishment of worldly wisdom to the grace of wisdom that is from above. So point three, the wisdom from above in verse six. But he gives more grace. Therefore it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6 is the foundation for turning from worldly wisdom to heavenly wisdom. I believe the bud in verse 6 can be linked to the bud in chapter 3, verse 17. He finished describing wisdom from below, and now he moves to describe wisdom that is from above. 317 says, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial 
and sincere. Ending his explanation of worldly wisdom with the power of man's sinful nature to jealously envy one's own desires, but follows it up with, but he gives more grace. The point is that man's sinful nature, it is powerful, and it fills the human will. But God's grace is more. Is that not powerful and comforting for each one of us? I like how the LSB and the NASB translate it, this verse. He says, but he gives a greater grace. Man's sin is powerful, but God gives a greater grace. His grace is not just greater in quantity, but it's greater in power. Right? Although man's sinful nature jealously yearns for his own sinful desires, God's grace is so much greater, so much more powerful than your own sinfulness. And this tells us that God is not only willing to overcome your sinfulness, but that he is also able. As one commentator says, he gives us grace potent enough to meet this and every other evil spirit. God's grace, it is so powerful that it changes the man or the woman from pride to humility. It's a blatant lie that any sin or person is beyond the power of God's grace. Look again at the text. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Here he's quoting from Proverbs 3.34, which reads, Toward the scorners, he is scornful, but to the humble, he gives favor. You see, to those who scoff and mock God, those that are friends with the world, that are seeking their own passions, it says that God scoffs at them in return. But God's grace, again, is so powerful that those who have been brought forth by the will of God, through the word of truth, that's James 1.18, know and have experienced God's grace, which leads to a changed life. The power of his grace always results in a changed life, right? which means for us that his grace does demand a response. He demands a life of humility. And that is the point that James has been making again over and over throughout the epistle. You say you believe in God, you say you have faith, but what is seen in your life does not match what you are saying. The evidence, again, does not support the testimony and is therefore not credible. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. God is opposed to those that are described in verses 1 through 5. They are at enmity with God and they will exhibit the behaviors of the world and refuse to obey God's word. The unsaved man, he is bound to his own selfishness, meaning that before Christ, his will is free only to choose according to his strongest sinful desire. And that person has no claim on God's greater grace. But, but those that have truly received God's grace will respond in humility. The early church father Augustine wrote, the first way to truth is humility, the second way is humility, and the third way is humility. If humility does not precede our wisdom and help, our efforts are meaningless. And this is exactly, again, what we see James saying. He moves from man's sinfulness to God's powerful grace. Verse 6 begins with humility, and verse 10 ends with humility. These are two bookends, which forms what is known as an inclusio. It's a, a literary tool to bring to our attention the main point, which is to be humbled before the Lord. This is the opposite of being friends with the world. It is believing God's word and obeying God's word. Isaiah 66, 2. All these things my hand has made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. 
Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit, humble. It's referring to those who recognize their sinful nature, see their need for a savior, and then are humbled before God's word, which results in obedience. Instead of seeking your own selfish, sinful passions, your passions then change and you start to seek the desires that are of Christ. God's great grace, it is the antidote to spiritual adultery against God, which brings forth humility. Between these two bookends, we're given a list of commands that calls every person to repentance and purifying faith, which brings us to our final point, point four, the call to repentance. The call to repentance, point four, seven through ten. In these four verses, they reveal what true faith and repentance look like. Not in a formulaic sense, meaning that if you check these boxes, then you're going to be saved. Rather, it's in the sense of the fruit that flows out of the power of God's grace. And through my study, again, I believe that James is now calling the deceived. Those that say that they have faith, but have no evidence of faith to come to true repentance. James is a general epistle, meaning it was written to a general audience. And he knew by what he was seeing that there were many deceived unbelievers. And so from pointing out their selfish passions, friendship with the world, calling them adulterous people, now sinners and double-minded, it becomes clear that he's not speaking to those of faith, but he's giving a general call of repentance. So to the deceived unbeliever, submit yourself to God. This is a reestablishment of the proper hierarchy where God is your Lord instead of self-idolizing and committing a spiritual adultery. Unbeliever, submit to God, the maker of heaven, of earth, and of you. You know by the testimony of creation and the truth of his word that he is God. So do not remain as his enemy, but submit to him by his grace. Stop chasing your passions. Stop chasing your desires that have proven time and time again to be an empty pursuit. You know it's never ending. Stop thinking just a little bit more. Just a little bit more money. Just a, a better job. Right? If only I had a better job, then, then I would be happy. That is wisdom from below and is a lie. Students, stop thinking that a little more popularity will bring you joy. Stop thinking that your identity is found in relationships. Until you find your identity in Christ, you will live a life of frustrated desires. And you will never be satisfied. True God-given humility. It begins with the submission to God. And then we see that repentance is immediately follows. We see this in the text. Repentance immediately follows. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. This is, by definition, repentance. Turning from one's selfish, sinful, prideful passions. Resisting the devil. Resisting the wisdom from below. And drawing near to God. Your opposition towards Satan, it cannot be neutral. There is no middle ground. We've already seen that friendship with the world is enmity against God. And true submission to God will reveal a life of repentance. A life that fights to resist the devil. It means to stand against or to oppose the enemy. Instead of being at enmity with God, you are now at enmity with Satan. Again, quoting from MacArthur, he makes the point that salvation brings a change of masters, a change of allegiance, and a change of family. 
The believer's life is turned from serving the devil to serving God. And from being a slave of sin and of Satan to being a slave of righteousness and of God. So submit. Resist the devil. But you can't just stop there. You can't land in that so-called neutral zone. There is no neutral zone. You must draw near to God, and then he will draw near to you. This is the notion of sincere remorse and humility. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says that godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. So do not profess a, a faith that is mere lip service, but turn to Christ today. Stop worrying about whether, what others think. Stop saying that you have faith, but then make every effort throughout the week to look like the world. It is an empty, frustrated pursuit of sin. Sincerely turn to Christ. Submit to his lordship. Resist the devil. Draw near to God. And he promises that he will draw near to you. And James issues two more commands in verse 7. And it forges the link between the experience of God's great grace and the life of obedience. He says, cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. This encompasses the entire person. It's not just external behavior, but the entirety of the whole. Psalm 24, 3 to 4. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. The Christian life is not one where you pick and choose which verses you want to follow. It's not checking the box of attendance on Sunday or watching the live stream. It's not coming to church just because your parents do. Only those who have clean hands and a pure heart, meaning those who do not lift their soul to what is false, to wisdom that is from below, and those that do not profess faith deceitfully. You see, if all we do is say that our heart is clean on the inside, while your life is full of sin, then by definition, you are what James calls the double-minded man. But the opposite is true as well. If you clean your life up morally, not participating in worldly pursuits, yet your heart is still desperately sick, then you also, by definition, are the double-minded man. Both instances are committing spiritual adultery. The only way for you and I to have clean hands and a pure heart is to humbly submit ourselves before the Lord. Trust that it is only through the work of Christ that is applied by the power of the Holy Spirit that purifies your whole being. You must mourn. You must weep over your sin. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom, he tells us. Laughter in Scripture, it's most often associated with those that are foolish, those that are mocking the call to live rightly according to Scripture. And I'm sure many of us have been mocked because we desire to live rightly according to Scripture. Luke 6.25 says, Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and you will weep this type of carefree friendship with the world attitude it puts you at enmity with god do not laugh and scoff at god about your passions but mourn over your sin confess your sin to god he who is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins don't be double-minded don't continue to suppress the truth. It is plain to you. As we're learning in Romans, you are without excuse. So see your sin against God. Humble yourself. Turn to Jesus Christ, whom God sent out of his love for you to satisfy God's wrath against your sins. 
Christian, professing Christian, does your life reveal wisdom from below or wisdom that is from below, above? Again, all of us must humbly submit ourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt us. Our sin is powerful, but God's grace is more. Let us pray. Father, the depths of your words, they are unsearchable. I know that I cannot do justice to the depths of its riches. So I trust in the power of the word itself. Lord, if anyone is deceived and merely gives lip service to your name, give them ears to hear today. May they turn to the power of your grace and submit humbly before you. Give them eyes to see their sin. Cause them to mourn over it. Lord, for the believers in the room, may we remember the power of your grace that has brought us out of darkness and into light. That same grace that saved is the same grace that empowers us to walk holy and upright lives. Father, if anyone is struggling or is caught up in sin, may they return to the power of that great grace by which you've called them. May we not look to our own works, but to the saving work of Christ. Father, we pray as a church for unity, that there would not be fighting and quarreling among your people, but that we would be known by our love for you and our love for one another. Amen.